Okay, thanks, Jim. So it's good to be here. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, if you're like me, um, you may have reached your monthly or your yearly limit on the number of equations that you can process in any one seminar. So I have waved my hands, I think, and eliminated all equations from the forthcoming presentation. We'll see if I got them all. Um, this is about concrete retrofitting techniques, so this will be a little bit more about what we've been doing rather than what's coming uh, in the future, but uh, uh, some of this may be a little new to some of you. For some of you, this may be things that you have seen many times before. So hopefully there's a little bit for everybody. Um, I'll be going over um, kind of a history of what's in FEMA 547, but with a focus on the concrete portions of that. Uh, that doesn't have too many real-life examples in it. It's, it's um, deliberately not a case study document, so we've thrown in some case studies from some real projects, um, not just ours, but uh, other people's projects as well. And as an added little bonus uh, today, there's a, a new project that's coming along that provides design examples for AC41, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, FEMA 541, which I brought the tome uh, here, if you get it from FEMA, it looks like this. If you get it from NIST, or got it from NIST when you could, it looked like that. It's the same document, though. It's a big guy, um, and a lot of hard work went into it. It was a while ago, but um, to my mind, it's still pretty current, um, which is nice. Uh, a lot of people in the room worked on it. Jim worked on it. Kelly Cobain worked on it. Bill and I, uh, a whole host of other people did as well. We were trying to compile documents, or techniques there, retrofitting techniques there, not everything that you could ever do, that would be an even bigger tome, but the popular ones, the common ones that uh, we had found through experience were the ones that were particularly effective, you know, things that weren't too obscure, things that people did a lot of. And we weren't telling you how to analyze a building at all. We were telling you really about detailing, constructability, some of the research bases, some, is it proprietary, um, just the things you have to deal with as a practicing engineer to implement and produce construction documents. Um, it was also to you know, give you a whole kind of seminar discussion on efficiencies that come about and how you uh, provide techniques that can mitigate those efficiencies. As I look around the room, it was probably not intended for too many people in this room. This looks like a relatively experienced crowd. Um, on the other hand, that's probably a pretty low bar or a low statement here. I think there's actually quite a lot in this document that even people who've been around a long time could benefit from. You may have done a lot on one topic and you may not have tackled a different material. And so there's, there's a lot in there for everybody. Um, oops. Okay, so the, the document's really in three big parts. There's an uh, overview intro part where we give a lot of advice on strategy and um, what's wrong with buildings and how do you tackle those things in the global sense, in the big picture sense. And then we have the middle document, really a part of the document, where we split things up by building types. There are a lot of different organizational strategies we could pick, but and we went through thinking about a lot of them, um, but we decided to focus on the FEMA middle model building type uh, as the organizing principle. So you have a concrete building, what do you do with it? I mean, that's sort of the strategy. You know, everybody isn't going to approach this in the abstract. This is project specific. So you've got that building already. You've evaluated that building. Now you have to fix it. You have a general sense of what you're going to do to fix it. So what are the techniques in that true wall building, in that unreinforced masonry building that are common to that? So within those chapters about those building specifics, we listed and went into more detail about those techniques that were common for that type. There's some things that happen all over the place. Every building has a foundation, and the foundation underneath a URM building, underneath a reinforced masonry building, may not be too different. It's usually a strip footing uh, or a spread footing on the inside. So we did combine some things in part three. Um, diaphragms, foundations, um, base isolation, passive damping, that kind of thing were in there. Um, so here's a, a list of chapters. Uh, we didn't pick all of the possible building types that are out there in the world, but we picked most of the ones that are in, um, in typical FEMA documents, including AC 31 and 41. Uh, I've highlighted in red things that 
have the word concrete in them in some way or another, um, and we've talked about those to some degree today. So there's a lot of focus on shear walls um, and frames and precast concrete, uh, concrete that has infill, whether it's masonry or, or various kinds of masonry. So there's a lot of emphasis in this document about concrete. So I think in terms of people who are retrofitting concrete buildings, this is a good source to look for uh, advice. So we described that model building type, um, so that will be very familiar to people. And then we tried to have a consistent strategy of organizing the documents so that once you got a little bit familiar with it, it would look uh, easy the next chapter you went in, you wouldn't have to rethink. And we would talk about the nature of that construction so you could figure out which category you were in, how does it vary, what are the key attributes that are important from a seismic point of view of that building type, how has it behaved in past earthquakes, um, what are the important things to worry about. And then we had an organizing strategy of categorizing or discretizing the types of deficiencies. Um, so the list you can see here, global strength, um, so you know how much shear wall strength, how much concrete moment frame strength do you have, stiffness, some building types like a shear wall building, not a big deal, a moment frame a very big deal. Um, do you have configuration issues like soft stories or plan irregularities? You know, you are in building is your load path a problem because the floors and the walls are not well connected? Um, and, and the other ones there. And so the, the key then is we created these tables where we've got in every chapter we've got the, these major deficiency categories on the vertical axis and then we've got ways to fix them in general categories. We call them these rehabilitation techniques. So if we sort of zero in on lining up these guys in, in one box in there. So let's say that you had a steel building and that's an S1 building and you had a soft story and you wanted to add something new. What, what are the common ways that you might do that? And so we list those out and then those send you to sections either within that chapter or if it's better found in another chapter, uh, you go to those. So within you know, every chapter we have a list of common techniques. You know, here's, here's a sample of those kind of things. And then for each technique, we had a consistent strategy of well, of telling you um, what specifically can you fix with that technique. What's it good for, what it's not good for. Um, what is it exactly in, in fairly detailed uh, descriptions. What are the design issues you have to think about quantitatively, analytically, uh, to worry about, to make sure you don't forget about? Does it have any research basis? Um, we spent a long time trying to collect research documents. Uh, a ton of work had been done up to that point. Lots more has been done since. You heard about you know how things are constantly changing and databases of test data are constantly increasing. So. At that moment in time when we were doing it, we were summarizing that. And what is interesting to me and pretty sad is despite all of the research that's out there in the world, you know, a lot of which is good, many, many, many of these techniques that we use all the time have very little research behind them of, of any significance that, that really drives or proves what we're doing, um, which is, if you think about it, an interesting use of resources in our community. Um, so a big focus on DTEC. So these were, the people who were writing this document all had lots of experience with you know, actually implementing retrofits on small buildings, big buildings. So there's a big focus, lots of pictures, lots of, and I'll show you a few of, here's typical detail for that, and there's a commentary that goes with it. Watch out for this. Think about that. Don't do it this way. Here's why. Um, so that you know, when you're putting together construction documents, you would have sort of words of warning and, and things to, to look for and watch out for. Uh, sometimes a technique might be more disruptive, it might be noisy, it might be dusty, it might take some big hunking piece of equipment to actually get in there, or there isn't a equip piece of equipment to do what you really would need. So we tried to put that in there. Um, we're not contractors, but we've been around for a while, so we, we had some of that. We have sort of qualitative discussions of relative costs. You know, that's a technique that you could do, but it's a lot more expensive than this one. So you might want to think about doing it the other way. Um, 
We mentioned as politely as possible whether something was proprietary. You know, it may be that there's a technique that's out there that so there's only one vendor who sells that thing. Um, and so we needed to, to warn you about that. So here's a smorgasbord of, of some, you know, if you had a, an older building and you wanted to add a frame, you know, we've all seen people adding brace frames in buildings. So how do you do that? Um, you see it here from the outside. What you don't see, which is the hard part, is how do you connect it to the building to make sure it actually attracts and takes the loads and, and delivers things. So we show different configurations and how those configurations um, have to get through diaphragms and around columns and underneath floors and through the foundations and we talk about you know different ways to do those and what the issues are. Um, we tell you that you're not going to find very many research programs about people adding brace frames in concrete buildings. There's a few. I'll mention some. Um, it's Tent, you know, tempting to use the concrete columns as part of your lateral system, and usually that doesn't work very well because they usually have their own problems of uh, insufficient capacity or lap splice limitations. So we talk about adding things on the insides of those. We talk about how it's difficult to transfer things around, um, how you still have deformation compatibility issues, which I think has come even more to the fore as the years have gone by about uh, how much stiffness is needed to protect the gravity columns from having issues of when they're drifted sideways. The, the big thing, and we talk a lot about in the concrete chapter, is how to connect stuff, which seems to be the hardest part. So these aren't the sexiest details, but they just begin to show you some of the issues of adding steel onto concrete. Um, you've got to have tolerances, you've got to have um, usually oversized holes and weld washers. Uh, you've got to be able to get things in an ability. You've got to have access. Sometimes you're going to shock weld something in advance. Sometimes you're going to allow field welding. It might be the only way to do it. So we show lots of different pictures on how to do that kind of stuff. Um, there's a series of buildings over in, in Berkeley that were done many years ago. Um, Jim's firm, Dinkel, was involved in this. This is an interesting research program where they had a portfolio of buildings, and so they try to come up with techniques and work with uh, UT to, to come up with a system that was sort of consistent and focused on that building type. So they, they looked at how to combine the braces with existing columns, how to fit them in, and actually, you know, tested specific details. So I thought that was sort of an unusual and interesting um, challenge and, and neat thing that they were able to do. So we show some of those in, in more generic sense of how do you get past from one side of a column to the other and drill between longitudinal bars and shove things through from one side to the shock weld and field weld them on the other side. How do you account for tolerances since the building's not going to be straight and things are going to be wiggling out? How much, is, how much of that do you need? Um, how do you deal with corrosion protection? And, steels on the outside, back priming things, and field painting the front side. Um, this is not part of those buildings, this is a quick sideways thing, but every, every now and then you get this opportunity. So you have a short column and you actually get to fill it in, um, which is a good thing. Uh, I don't think I've ever been able to do this. Um, uh, this. This has our company name on it, so we must have done it at some point, but it wasn't me. Um, so uh, maybe this is the one that's out there. Um, so this is one I did work on. So this is a building at Stanford. It's a dorm. It's a dorm I actually lived on, lived in many years ago. And it, it was an uh, older concrete building. Um, concrete walls, concrete floors, tile on a wood roof. Um, and uh, the diaphragms needed some help. That wood roof had to span a long distance. Heavy stuff on top of it, heavy walls out of plane. So the demands on the wood roof were pretty staggering. And so it needed, it wasn't a matter of you could just strengthen the roof. You needed to, to cut the diaphragm span. So we added some walls, which doesn't sound all that hard and all that interesting, um, but it's an occupied building. So any of those of you who have worked in existing buildings, you know that you know it's pretty rare when they're just sitting there vacant and you get that opportunity to take as much time as you wanted. So this was split into two phases. 
over two summers. And uh, here's a cross-sectional view through that. So we had sidewalls, we had corridors to go through, so you know, we created a nice little coupling beam to dissipate some energy at the top. But the big thing we're doing is connecting the roof to get down and then reducing the demands on the second floor and first floor. So the first phase was to go up to the first floor. Um, we're actually backwards. Um, so we started at the bottom, obviously. And, and uh, I never noticed that. Um, anyway, um, so we went up to the bottom, and then the next summer we went up to the top. Um, so uh, it was kind of interesting. We, we, to get into the bottom, we dug a hole in there, and we had these very small little backhoes that turned out to be more efficient than, than other techniques of getting dirt out, and then and we put rebar in there. Um, so what was kind of interesting to me, at least, is this older building had one of these floor systems where there were orthogonal bars and diagonal bars around the columns. And they were really, really small bars. And as you can see here, there's a whole heck of a lot of tiny little bars. So one of the challenges when you're adding, in this case, a slot, you're trying to put a shear wall through a building is, what do you do with the existing stuff? Do we just want to go out there with a big saw and hack through it and sever that floor from what's holding it up? Well, no. So usually we either core little things and connect discrete, isolated things all along. That gives us a chance to pour uh, concrete in the holes. Or we chip and try and preserve the bars. So we set a limit here of X percent of the bars could be cut with handheld chipping guns. And that was 10 or 15 percent. And we had done some analysis to figure out that that would work with um, gravity transfer. And, and they were actually pretty successful in doing stuff. They bent them, um, but they didn't actually um, break them. So then we were bearing you know, couplers in here, uh, good couplers, uh, hopefully. And, and then at the end of that first year, the carpet went back, and we covered these guys up. And um, the next summer, we came back and connected, pulled back the carpet, connected to it, and, and we were shock creating walls. So shock creating very common in existing buildings. And in this case, these were selected against an existing wall. So we were able to use the existing old lath and plaster wall as the form on one side very effectively, and shock create on the other side. So there wasn't any form work. Um, and I'd say that's pretty common in existing buildings uh, to take advantage of, of that chance. You can see boundary zones were put in in there. Um, so continuing the connection and continuing my little speech about lack of research, there's relatively little research other than some work by UT many years ago about just how if you if you connect this thing to that thing and you pull on it cyclically in an earthquake, things that we rely on, these drill dials that we do, it's just not much. Um, the, the vendors, you know, Simpson and Hilti and, and many other quality firms have done lots of research through uh, AC standards, through ICC requirements and others. It's generally focused on an individual dial going into an individual hole pulling it or shearing it sideways in, in a rigorous way. As the years have gone by, that's gotten ever more thoughtful and, and comprehensive. But it's just this one little thing. So expanding that into the larger connection of the rest of the pieces of what that dowel connects to along the rest of our load path is generally missing. Um, so you know, if we want to put in a new wall, we've got that issue of connecting the new wall to the existing stuff. We have deformation compatibility that's a um, lot more work, I would say, since when we did this analytically, not much more work from a testing point of view. Um, we've got the question, are we going to put it on the outside, are we going to put it on the inside, are we going to fur it, are we going to expose it, um, are we going to leave openings for mechanical and electrical systems, how are we going to transfer things through the floor, when are we going to shore, who's going to design the shoring, are we going to specify the things on the drawings related to the contractor. Um, so as an example of, and we have lots of pictures like this in there. So let's say you had a flat slab building, um, which is similar to that one, that, that university that I was showing you a minute ago. In this, 
you know, we're saying don't cut the existing reinforcing, don't core drill, don't saw cut, use you know, light impact tools to chip things away and preserve the rebar. Um, so that would be a continuous slot option. Other ones where you might keep a piece of the slab and drill cores selectively through, you might GPR it, survey it to find out where you could put those, or you might just bite the bullet and lose some of the rebar, put things in bigger pores, so you can pour the concrete and get it from the top down into the bottom. Um, that, what if you had joists or a waffle slab? You know, it gets a little more complicated, but the idea uh, remains the same. Where are you going to put the cold joints? Um, where are you going to lap things? You know, we talk about all those issues. Um, we have a fair amount of discussion about collectors. Um, so, I think Russ asked a question about that this morning for a different reason, but. Um, in a concrete building, we have these discrete walls or discrete brace or discrete enhancement of an existing thing, and then we often have trouble delivering loads to that place. And so we have discussion in there, which I won't show, about putting steel elements in there to drag the loads. I'll show you a few pictures of putting concrete elements. In concrete buildings, we're always worried about compatibility. Is the concrete shearable system compatible with the amount of tolerable drift that the gravity columns can take. Similar issues with collectors. If I put a huge collector from here to the back of the room and, and by the time I've stretched it to take the load, it's stretching you know, an inch or something, then it's not going to work very effectively because the rest of the building is trashed by that time. So you have to think about that in all the elements you're designing, particularly these big guys if they're big um, collectors. Uh, and you know, how do you get them in? Um, how do you uh, deal with things that are in the way? You know, do you have ducts and pipes that are in the way? You often do with collectors because they're usually on the bottom side of the ceiling where other things are there. Um, so here's, here's one way to do it. So if we were dowling into the underside of a slab and forming that, how would we place the concrete? Um, you know, many times I have seen this our office and other people's of just showing something and with no thought about how they would actually build this. You know, are they going to somehow put a form all the way to the underside of the slab and, and where's the concrete going to get in there? And so if you're relying without telling them about a hole that they have to put in, what if there's something nice on the top and putting that hole has limitations? So you as a structural engineer, I think, have to think about how they're going to do what you want them to do. Uh, and that's more true in existing construction than it is in new construction by, by a lot. So this one assumes some pore holes. Um, you know, you can dry pack the top, you can pour things under pressure, you can vibrate through little holes in the top of the formwork. It can be done from below, but it's hard. And it's not usually as successful. So here is a monster collector, and this is a huge concrete building at, um, uh, at, at a UC uh, near you. Um, and uh, it's, you know, you can imagine, what about the weight of this thing? Because this, you know, this had to be checked. Uh, the load transfer is, is enormous, trying to go from one place to this building to get back to a core. Um, this is about as big a one as, as I have seen. Um, Here's a building at Berkeley. Uh, this is, for those of you who don't know, this is the architectural headquarters of Berkeley. Um, maybe not in everybody's favorite architectural style anymore. Um, certainly not mine. But um, anyway, it's a uh, historic building, and it uh, was in need of retrofitting. So uh, one of the issues with that, it didn't have enough strength. It didn't have enough ductility. Um, the shear walls had plenty of vertical reinforcing, not enough horizontal reinforcing, so they're all shear critical. Um, not, not uncommon in an older building. And then it had your discontinuities. Had these thin columns that I'll show you on the outside of the building. So one of the key architectural features on, on portions of this building were these thin columns. And it had other stuff. So um, here are these guys on the outside going up. So it was to, you know, give it some fenestration, give it some sexiness on the outside, and they have 
they're eccentric. So they have torsion, um, you know, that was dis discussed this morning, um, apparently from Jack's point of view, not as big a deal as, as we probably thought back then um, today, but it was a big deal during this assessment. So the goal, and this is often the goal in protecting gravity systems is let's stiffen this guy up enough, let's add enough strength to protect these things that have limited drift capability. Um, because it would be different, we're not going to go wrap FRP around those exterior columns, and we're not going to go fatten them, at least we weren't in the end, going to go fatten them with a big you know, pile of concrete around them, and we weren't going to take them out either and replace them. They were key features of the building. It turned out when we did that, that, that just wasn't all that successful. Um, just we needed so much stuff to do that that we couldn't cut the drift down. So one of the things that I'll show you here, and I'll show you another building that I've seen a fair amount of, and you don't usually see this in the books usually, um, is let's, let's put a supplemental support. Let's put a suspender or a shoring post underneath these guys, and let's allow them to drift or allow them to crack, but then this thing that we put underneath it can provide the, the gravity support that we're worried about losing in the element itself. And so we ended up choosing to do that on the inside. Um, so here they are. There's these, you know, during construction, um, here are some steel um, pipes that are providing that support right in board of that guy on the outside for the part that they were supposedly supporting along this edge here, that, that beam. And that allowed us to, to do less work on the inside. So this is an element-focused supplemental support. And I'll show here a different university with a different, with a similar kind of problem in a way. Uh, this is a pretty interesting case study. So this is a dorm um, at Stanford, uh, old dorm. Um, and here is a photo that um, was found. Stanford um, and Berkeley both do an incredibly good job of keeping records. Um, they, they, both, they do it in a different way, not surprisingly, but they do a really good job in their maps and records departments of keeping track of things. So if you want the old drawings, original drawings for building, they usually have them. They keep track of all the retrofits, they number things, they're easily accessible. This building kind of fell through the cracks. And so when they were looking to figure out what it was, they actually weren't quite sure. They, they didn't have the structural drawings anymore. And so a photo was discovered, and you can kind of see um, this under construction. And so from a distance, can anybody tell what kind of building is this? Reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete. Yes, it's a reinforced concrete seminar. Good guess. Uh, <laughs> uh, a little more specific than that. Um, Marie cannot answer this because Marie and Bill did the work on this building, but I'm uh, Craig. Um, so here's a blow up of this little spot. Okay, so you still think it's concrete? It's concrete with hollow clay tile and fill. And you should immediately cringe and get all tense as a structural engineer and you should feel, you know, kind of nervous. Okay, why should you feel nervous? Because here is VA San Fernando um, and if you look kind of carefully you can see it's not doing very well. Uh, it's on the ground. Um, that building looks a lot like that dorm. About the same size, about the same height, it's kind of irregular in plan, same vintage, not too far away from one another. So when that photo was found, um, the powers that be got nervous and they made an executive decision to um, close the building over the holidays. So this was found prior to the winter break. Students got a letter um, saying, I'm sorry, but when you come back, you're not gonna be living in that dorm anymore. We're gonna find you a new place to live. Um, so I was actually a student at the time, and I was an RA in another dorm. And so where those students went were in the lounges of other dorms. Um, so they showed up back in January and you know, your new home is that closet over there or that 
desk. We'll move the desk for you so we can put your bed in there. So it's obviously a big deal. So there was a lot of pressure to do this fast and to do, you know, a very cost effective, you know, what's the biggest deal kind of thing because we've got these kids that are out, we need to move back in. So the scheme that they came up with, um, which is not, which I think is very innovative and a great idea and, and sort of seen ripples of this over the years, but it's the power scheme where we needed strength, needed stiffness, so let's concentrate it in rooms and not lose portions of the building. So they, these are the best rooms to be in if you're a uh, structural engineer, okay? <laughs> They're a little smaller than the rest of the rooms because the, the walls are now 12 inches, you know, fatter. Um, but they're the safest places to be. And so they were placed in, you know, in all the wings and deliberately done. And then collectors um, were put in along the, the concrete floors to drag things back in. Um, but not everything could be done. Um, so there was a choice that was made to say, okay, we've done the biggest important things and down the road we'll do the rest of the stuff, which had to deal with reentrant corners at the joints, the hollow clay tile, what are we gonna deal with? We've stiffened it up enough so we feel pretty good about it, but we still may have worries about out-of-plane behavior. So the years went by. I graduated, ended up working at the same firm as Mary and Bill, and it is, came on my shoulders to do the next step, part, part two, you know, many, many years later. Oh, the one good thing I forgot to mention is, is that so they, as soon as we're kicked out, there's this furious amount of work by the design team and the contractor, and it was just finished, and the Loma Prieta earthquake happened, and it was not damaged, other than a little bit of cracks. And so the this decision, which was pretty monumental, somewhat unprecedented decision, was people probably felt very, very good about that. Um, uh, lucky uh, as well, but but you know, good that they made that tough call. So anyway, we had some remaining issues, one of which is to deal with, we've got these, this very irregular building, and how do we connect it together and how do we not worry about things falling apart at the reentrant corners, at these joints. Um, we also had the problem of the middle wing, sort of the grand wing of this building, you know, that portion right there, this portion right there, doesn't have any stairs in it. Um, so you have to go down the hall, if you're living in that one, to the next wing to go down the stairs. So the stairs are not in the most perfect location. You probably wouldn't be able to do that today. Um, but that was one of the issues, is making sure that we would have a route of egress. We always talk about that as engineers, protect the route of egress, you know, avoid falling hazards and stairs and things. And we basically never do it. Um, but this, in this building, or we never do anything special about it. In this building, it was a big deal. So we, we had, to think about this, and we did a you know, fancy nonlinear model of the building, and we had sort of several basic conceptually different ideas to deal with this. So the classic engineer approach is just slice it up, put a joint in it, you know, take out that big saw and, and cut the thing free and, and then make it big enough and you won't have to worry about things pounding, it'll be nice and clean, everything's a rectangle, it'll behave just the way you want it, don't have to worry about torsion. Um, that would go right through the bathroom, um, through the showers, through the toilets, um, next to the stairs, across a corridor, uh, has to go to the outside wall. So if you put your architect's hat in, they would say, you know, are you crazy? Um, that's about the dumbest thing I've ever heard of. And how are we gonna deal with all those problems you listed? So, which we know, but that, that becomes an obvious concern. So the next thing is, okay, go the other way. Let's, we know it's gonna pull apart. Our analysis had showed, you know, very difficult. It's gonna bang for sure. Let's tie it together. The floor is about this thick, okay? Pan joist floor. So trying to put something below is hard, trying to put something on the top that can connect into that and can transfer enormous numbers of kips from one wing to another turned out to be very hard. And we would have to have dragged things back enormous distances um, and so that wasn't looking promising. And those ties would have had to go through bathroom areas as well. So, you know, we can draw these little pictures in books about ties and everything, but here's the real world where they're, they're going through, you know, tough things. So a third idea, and we have a few versions of this idea, is, 
is the supplementary support area. It sounds um, elegant and mystical. Um, what, what does that mean? Um, that is, remember we had the fin column, put a pipe underneath something in a URM building, it's required in the IEBC to put a post underneath the truss. It's a belt and suspender, it's a backup system. So that's the area that's gonna get damaged. We said, let's put a bunch of supports underneath this area so that if it cracks right there, if it cracks right there and we lose what's holding it up, that we will have a system that will hold it up. So essentially we're pre-shoring the building uh, locally. And so what does that look like? Um, it looks like this. Um, it's actually a pretty healthy steel frame. Um, looks like a whole new framing system underneath the joist around an elevator, you know, through the woods and, and grandmother's house. But um, it provided a way to provide um, guide rail bracing for the elevator and a few other little bells and whistles. But we back up shored this area. So it's going to crack and we're going to live with the cracks, but it's not going to fall down because we got all this stuff in there. Okay, so another big part of our document is discussion of FRP. So those of you who've done retrofitting uh, are well aware that this is, you know, lots and lots of FRP companies, techniques, processes. We have a pretty long discussion in the document about FRP. Um, it, there's lots of different types of um, systems. Uh, carbon fiber, probably the most common that, that you see out there in, in the industry now. Um, can be woven in one direction, two directions, diagonal directions, can be in you know things that are that big or it can be like a, a weaving of cloth, can be protruded even into plastic shapes. Uh, so usually we see rolls of this stuff being used in various things. Um, so one of the things to appreciate if you're not already familiar, is that this stuff is really strong. It's a lot stronger than rebar, it's a lot stronger than concrete, and it's also really brittle. So I mean, from a force displacement point of view, it kind of goes up and it doesn't go very far when it yields. It just reaches a point and, and snaps. Um, so that fundamental thing, which is very different from mild steel in our reinforced concrete buildings, is the overriding concern that, that drives everything about thinking, both the analysis but also design, and you have to appreciate that um, or you're kidding yourself and you'll start doing things that don't make sense um, and won't work really. So when we were doing this literature search for this document, what I was sort of stunned to discover is that everyone and their dog has done the same research project of wrapping a column in every country around the world. It is the biggest waste of research money I've ever seen in my life um, because they have all done the same thing. They haven't done all the other things that you would like them to do. So if you want to know whether you should be wrapping FRP around the end of a wall and whether it will work better if you do that. If you want to know about going up the side of something and when you shear on it, it's going to pull out, how many fiber anchors do you need to go in there to stop that from happening? There's hardly anything. Um, there's some big companies that have done a pretty amazing amount of work, but even they haven't done it all. So to my mind, and this is one person's opinion, it, it's surprisingly misplaced what people have done. Um, lots of it's great, though. I mean, it's neat that we have it. So there's a ton of stuff to draw on, but it just seems like it, there's a lot of redundancy out there and a lot of gaps. Um, so there's not as much research as I would like to see about just the nature of capacity design and how do you achieve that and is the system that you put the FRP on and then tested, does it do what you want it to do? All kinds of these tests of FRP itself or wrapping a column, but not as much about a shear wall in a big building. Okay, so there's FRP that just has to touch, like wrapping a column, and FRP that has to stick, it has to be bond critical like a shear wall, otherwise if it just peels off, it doesn't work anymore. Um, and that, it sounds sort of obvious, but it's a big deal because they work differently and they, they have different techniques for adhesion and different requirements for testing. Um, so in addition to FRP having this brittleness issue, um, you often will find it is sensitive to sunlight, um, which is kind of weird, um, but it, it is. And so it also is not good in a fire and may or may not be good in temperature 
doesn't let any moisture go through it, which can be a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, you can have delamination issues if you're trying to have off-gassing from the inside of the building get through and the building's supposed to breathe and now you stopped it from breathing. If you run into it with a spike of something, like a car bumper in a garage and ding it, now you've got a little stress concentration and it's like you know hitting glass and you can start you know, propagating from that point. So it, it usually has added things that are added to it that protect it um, from those kinds of issues. It can be just paint. Um, or it can be a fire protection coating that actually costs as much as the FRP itself. So watch out. Um, if you are using this for gravity, you're in a whole other world. And if you're using it for seismic, and you're triggering a whole bunch of considerations and cost issues. Um, you know, preparing the surface is a big deal. Um, and then it's usually not considered the prettiest thing on Earth. So um, it usually gets covered up for aesthetic reasons as well. I have learned over the years, having done quite a number of FRP jobs, to my dismay, actually, that inspection and testing are a big deal. There's a lot of very quality firms that do this work, but there's a few that aren't. And, um, and so it is like most things in life, it's good to have inspection. What I found is that the tests that we specify for adhesion, and the these are ASTM tests, and that we test, and that we specify for pulling a specimen of FRP are extremely variable depending on who does the work, which is pretty shocking. So if it's an ASTM standard and I'm breaking a cylinder of concrete, I would not expect this testing lab and that testing lab to have too much of a difference from one another. What I found though is that if I have one lab test specimens and you can, you, know, you make these specimens because you don't pull them off the wall, it's, you can't do it that way. So you have to put down a layer of plastic and put some goo, the epoxy, and then put the FRP and, and try and simulate what you're doing usually in a 12 by 12 square, and then you cut it into pieces that are one inch thick. If I give this piece of one inch to Bill's lab, and I give that one inch of pieces to Heidi's lab, you will not get the same results because it all depends on the equipment and the testing lab. So this can be a big deal because you can be failing the criteria that the manufacturer has said they will meet, and it's totally fine, but it has to do with the testing lab. So uh, you can tell I'm a little bitter because I have been through this twice now in the last couple of years um, and it's, it's a long subject there's a there's a solution but it turns out you need very sophisticated equipment to, to do this consistently um, so why would we wrap a column um, we could wrap it if it doesn't have adequate shear strength probably the most common reason I would say it's a shear critical column so by adding horizontally oriented fibers we're enhancing the equivalent of the horizontal ties that are missing um, it might have a bar lap splice issue, um, and so we're confining it to better protect it for that. Um, might have a compression issue, that's pretty rare that we would wrap it for that and pretty challenging. Um, you got to be careful that you orient the fibers in the right direction. You got to show that on your drawings. Um, you got to not make it stronger longitudinally by accident. Um, and it sounds sort of obvious, but um, you know, be careful. So there's, you know, how far away from joints do you need to be and how many fibers. And the, the good news is that the, the big uh, vendors have researched, supported calculation methods. ACI for 40 and others have this. FIB has this. There's a lot of sources for figuring out how much um, and what kind of FRP you need that I would say is pretty consistent. Um, what's less true is that how, you know, you would like to wrap things all the way around. So let's let's say you're strengthening a beam here um, for shear, maybe. Well, how do I get the FRP through here? So you can you can drill a hole in in your slab if you have access, and it's not going to mess it up. You can put a, these horsetails or toes of the fiber, so you can have a swath of fiber. You can coalesce it into a little circle that looks kind of like a rebar, you can fit that through the hole, you can wrap it around the top and come back through. You know, it's a lot of work, but it can cost more, but that's one strategy. Or you could stop it from below and put some ties in. 
you could curve cut a slot at the underside of the slab and dive it in there and fill that with epoxy. You could leave out the ties. So you can imagine all those different methods have different results when you test them. Different levels of ductility, different levels of reliability, not so much research on what the numbers are for that, just a little bit. So that one kind of cries out for that. Same thing if you're wrapping around a corner. You know, I mean, if you have a stairwell and you want to strengthen it, it's not like this nice little rectangular wall out there where you can wrap it around all four sides, right? You've got this corner, there's a door somewhere. What do you do when you hit the door? So you have these issues about stopping and starting and whether you need to anchor it at the end. Think of it like the horizontal bars in our shear wall. We've got a hook that goes into the confined core at the end and that's holding our horizontal bar, which we're trying to pull on with, with the shear demands. Uh, FRP is the same thing. So that end is a big deal. And you can get a difference of, of two or more in terms of reliable capacity, depending on how you go around and how you anchor. Not as much research as we'd like. Um, if your shear and a coupling beam is, is dominated by the vertical direction, then the fibers are going to go up. If your shear in a wall is horizontal, which it typically be, then your fibers are going to go horizontally. So watch out for that, and you've got to show those and show where the anchors, if you're going to put anchors around the edge, which is desired, um, how, what's the spacing? What do they look like? Is it vendor specific? Um, we talk about all those issues in the book. Uh, so here is a recently completed, this is years ago during design. I went to the grand opening on this. Uh, two days ago. Um, so the new Student Center at Berkeley is an expansion of Martin Luther King, for those of you who went there, and then we demolished Eshelman uh, and replaced it with a new building. So it's got uh, a new building over to the right here, an existing building, but I'm gonna talk about the existing building since this is a retrofitting seminar. So this building, uh, you know, mid-century Beaux-Arts building, five stories above grade, two stories below grade, had been retrofitted before, but when they did that, they didn't know they were going to expand the thing big time with this project because they didn't have a student fee referendum that had passed in, to everybody's amazement. This is half funded by the students, half funded by your tax dollars, and um, it's got concrete walls. Interesting, it has steel inside all of this above from here on up, and it's, and it's concrete. So there were additions on two sides of this building. And, and so it wasn't just a retrofit, it was an expansion and a retrofit, which is sort of an unusual, interesting combination. So one of the things in the existing building over here on the right, you can see that below grade, not surprisingly, lots of walls because there's retaining walls. Um, and then as we go up, a fair amount of walls, and then not so many. Uh, so that turns out not to be well balanced with the demand, which does not drop off as significantly. So that's a key feature of this building. Uh, and then when we add new space in these additions, what are we going to do with that? Are we going to have it support its own load and put a joint in between the new and the existing? Are we going to add a whole bunch of strength in the new addition and drag things from the existing in? Are we going to put added strength in the existing building and drag stuff from the new across? So there's lots of possible choices. Um, in the end, due to architectural and programmatic reasons, we decided to balance these as well as we could to minimize collector demands by keeping loads home. So basically adding enough stiffness and strength in the additions to keep the loads there and support the loads there, and then let the existing building do its thing with what it was originally taking, but tie them together so we didn't have pounding, so we didn't have waterproofing issues. So that was the basic strategy. Um, so we analyzed this building in Perform, um, fiber model, big hunkin' uh, nonlinear model. Saeed is right here, did, did the vast majority of the work on this. And uh, we had soil structure interaction, we had springs, we had inelasticity all over the place. We did pushovers and we did response to screen analysis. Um, one thing I would mention, we took advantage of uh, base lab averaging and embedment effects to reduce the site-specific spectra and the response history analysis uh, demands on there. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with that, you ought to be. Um, this is more and more in vogue 
Um, we put a floor on it that was my judgment about what the test data and research from actual recorded earthquakes has set. So you, if you use those equations, you can sort of keep reducing things rather shockingly, but we said we're not gonna reduce them more than anything that's ever been recorded. Uh, but you can see, you know, like this orange to red, there's a fairly healthy reduction that you can get because we had huge embedment effects. I mean, we had a huge slab that could be averaged and a huge building and a huge site. So this is, this was like a classic site and project that just cries out for this. So when we put that model together, um, remember how I mentioned there's a lot of wall, medium-sized amount of wall, and then not very much wall at the, at the top of that? Um, here's the problem. Uh, the, the weakest link, the bottom of those upper stories is a soft story. Uh, sheer dominated behavior and a pushover curve that doesn't look very happy. Um, and so at the different levels of, of demand, we were getting, you know, yellows and reds, which are bad things happening. Uh, things that we didn't want to have happen. Uh, we're hitting ASC 41 uh, acceptance criteria limits. So we, um, to fix these excessive shear strains, we added some FRP on walls. Um, this building had been previously retrofitted. Russ's firm, Pharrell, had done the work and, and included some FRP on certain walls because we were looking at it at a higher set of demands and for some other reasons, we added, essentially added FRP where they hadn't um, and sort of, you know, just got the walls that didn't already have it. We didn't have to add things where they already had. But it made a big difference in, in that mechanism of behavior. So we, we were able to turn things that look like the, the red and the blue here, um, where we didn't add any FRP into the green. So, you know, look at the dramatic ductility that's been provided when we get something and we get rid of that sure critical mechanism that's dominating and now we turn it into something that's flexibly critical. So we can begin to go to much farther drift limits and we can begin to meet the uh, ASC 41 demands and meet the CDC chapter 34 limits and meet the UC seismic safety policy and blah, blah, blah. Um, so also at this building, so this is Martin Luther King that we were adding on to that side and over here off the screen. Um, there's also a plaza out there. So for those of you who are familiar, that's Laurel, Lower Sproul Plaza. And it, there's a parking garage underneath it. It's beams and slabs. It's got a few different kinds of columns and they have ductility issues. Um, they have sure critical problems. They have inadequate sure strength. Um, so they sort of are classic examples of concrete retrofitting um, needs. And so we did a pushover of these buildings and, and uh, you know, to find out what was sort of happening and what the mechanisms were and, and whether we were okay or not. It turns out we weren't. One of the unique features about this structure, which we took advantage of, is that um, this site, Zellerbach, big building, Chavez, big building, New Eshelman, big building, Martin Luther King, big building, and then this complicated plaza. All the little red things, those are thermal joints in the original structure. So it turns out this plaza is like seven different things, all bumper carring around, banging into one another in an earthquake, but protected from going very far by these big hunkin' buildings all around the site. So we said, well, there's no way the plaza is going to fail these buildings. And we looked at the buildings for the impact and the demands that the plaza would put on them. And we said, OK, we'll, we'll take advantage of the, the kind of drift limit, like a snubber in an air handling unit or, or a bumper in a way. Um, and so the question is, if this one's going that way and this one's going that way, there's all these different permutations, so it isn't just the static dimension that we have. We may have to deal with the fact they have different stiffnesses. So we, we looked at that, and we said, okay, even with that reduction in the amount of drift that could possibly happen, what occurs when it moves? And it turns out even then, with these small amounts, I mean, we're literally talking like this amount of movement in one story, we would get sure critical behavior in some of these things because the stirrups were so 
inadequate. They were places over D, um, and, and lots of places over D over two um, in a 1950s structure, which is a whole other interesting, sad story. Um, so we also found that some of the columns had nice spirals, and it was mentioned earlier how good that can be, um, and that certainly was true for us. Uh, so nice circular column with some nice spirals, actually very flexurally critical, didn't really need to do anything with it. Other guys, oval like this, that had ties and inadequate spacing, even though it looked like a lot of hairpins, not so good. So we wrapped the sure critical ones. We didn't wrap the flexurally critical ones. There were a few girders where we needed to do some things. And we actually ended up filling in the gap a little bit to reduce that gap. So we, the gap was maybe this big. We reduced it to this big so it still could work thermally, but we got that added benefit of it didn't have to drift as far. So it was a bit of a belt and suspenders thing. And we turned a pushover curve that has all these sort of failures um, you know, at, at points. Really the only thing that matters is the early failures uh, after you gotten collapse prevention in one of your columns, you're kind of dead. So um, if we wrap that guy, now we can get a pushover curve that looks like this. Um, so that was a good example of FRP. That um, is where I learned more than I wanted to know about testing issues with specimens of FRP. Uh, so here's some examples. This is where we went through the beams. So remember I was mentioning all those different strategies of you just go up to the top and stop. Um, you can see the fibers are being coalesced there and that fan, that fan is they're going up and they're now coming together and we've drilled a hole through the slab, we've gone up and we had a topping slab on top of this. So we were able to hide that guy that's going across the top underneath the topping slab underneath the waterproofing. So we were kind of lucky. You know, if that were the exposed surface on the top of the building, that's not going to, on a floor like this, that's not going to work. Um, this is before, and why is it got this, you know, bumpy shade of white on there? Is that a really poor job of painting, or is that something else? What is that? So this is first, this is second. Fireproofing, yeah. So this is a modest level of fireproofing that's being added. There are more severe versions of that. And then here's a wrapped oval column um, that looks pretty good. Um, so, should I stop? Five minutes, okay, no problem. Um, so, for the added bonus feature, or what the heck is that? Um, that is the design, design example guide. So some of you in the room um, may have heard of this. I gave a presentation on this at the SEAC convention. Um, we've heard a lot of talk about AC41 all day today. Um, for those of you who have used it, you may have said this isn't the world's easiest thing to use. Um, for those of you who haven't used it, you may have heard that and been a little scared to um, jump in. And you may have said, I wish that there were something like the SEOC seismic design manuals for new buildings for AC41. I wish Somebody had done some examples to help me out. So uh, FEMA has funded ATC in a project to, to do that very thing. Um, so we are halfway through it, and um, we're hoping to finish it. Well, not hoping. We will finish at the end of September of next year uh, to meet our deadline. And uh, so I'm going to give you a very, very short summary of what that thing is. So... Uh, What's the purpose of this document? That's sort of my standard shtick on documents. Who are we writing it for and what's it supposed to do? So this one is giving people like you uh, and me um, advice uh, on interpreting and using AC41 and doing that through design examples. Okay, so these are work design examples in detail on selected key topics. So we're not gonna go through every little provision in the book and we're not going to show you every provision through every building type, but we're going to show you a good set of stuff that's commonly occurring. We're going to give you commentary, pictures, flow charts, figures, um, advice, rationale, words of warning, as uh, much advice as we can put it in there. Um, who's it for? 
Um, it's for practicing engineers. It's again, probably you're not quite the target audience here. The target audience is a little greener and a little newer to the seismic game. You're expected to know how to design a lateral system. You're expected to understand the principles of seismic design. You're not expected to have used ASC 41. On the other hand, if you have used ASC 41, there's still gonna be, I think, valuable things in here for you um, as well. Our goal, what, what are the shoes thing? My, my goal here is that we're trying to think of putting ourselves in, in the shoes of that target audience when we write it, okay? So we're actually gonna have some focus groups people who are not me, who has used it a lot, and said, did I meet the mark, or am I overdoing it, or underdoing it? Um, we're gonna get lots of advice from people. SEOC, uh, through help from Russ, who's coordinating this effort, is going to plan check our document, um, so to speak, um, and we will internally plan check it, so there's a line-by-line -line review of calcs, um, and uh, hopefully we are able to do that in a efficient and quick way. Um, we're gonna try and cover all the big things that I think people have heartburn about, primary and secondary elements, which ones are they really, force control, deformation controls, not as obvious as you might think. There's lots of debates about that. We can try and make that clearer. The J factor and overturning and that sort of messy little subject we're gonna tackle. Why do they have you do so many tests? And is that really what you need to do or you're misunderstanding something? What, what are all those crazy performance objectives about? Um, big change in ASC 4113 is uh, the chapter on tier one screening and tier two deficiency-based evaluations. We're gonna talk about that at length. And then we're gonna do a bunch of examples of full buildings. Um, so here's sort of a list. We're gonna have wood buildings and steel buildings and concrete buildings, precast uh, tilt-up buildings, and then a big view on them. So I think it will be of great value. It's kind of a monumental topic that I didn't quite appreciate um, until I agreed to do it, what I was getting myself into. But um, a year from now, it'll be there. Thanks.